Hello everyone. This is Professor Ryan speaking and I'd like to welcome you to the Survey of Furniture and Interiors. The opening image here is what you would see if you looked into a kaleidoscope. I chose this because I think it represents quite well how we approach the material in this class. We'll be looking at the story of furniture and interiors from different shifting viewpoints, the result of which will be a rich, multi-dimensional understanding of these topics that are such fundamental tools of your trade. And this is not just for the interior design and architecture students. In addition to those majoring in related fields, such as industrial design, this class often attracts serious students studying history, sociology, and psychology, for example, who wish to gain a deeper understanding of the human experience through studying material culture, a very wise thing to do. For as you will see, each facet of this kaleidoscope reveals something new, insightful, useful, and hopefully inspirational, not only about design, but also about us as human beings. In part one of this presentation, I'll cover some of the vantage points from which we'll analyze these styles and review how we'll do this. But first, I'd like to talk about why the study of the history of furniture and interiors is so important for you as design professionals. If you're a designer in this field, fluency in this material is essential to your professionalism, but also to your creativity. What you see and hear in this class will remain with you, and when you're working on various design problems in the future, you'll draw upon this deep well of forms and ideas, sometimes purposefully, but often without even realizing it. In my opinion, though, the most important thing you can take away from this class is a deeper understanding of what the styles mean. For designers, this is the pathway to making your work more powerful. For everyone, it's a way of increasing your understanding of who we are, of yourself and others. And that is an insight that is invaluable, no matter what you do in life. What do we see here? The connection between a prehistoric dwelling and Frank Lloyd Wright's falling water. Scarabray was first discovered in 1850, but these dwellings were only uncovered around 1930. And during what years was Falling Water built? 1936 to 39, at the moment when a new interest in the organic had arisen among the most progressive architects and designers. Was Wright inspired by Scarabray? Possibly. Did he knowingly draw upon it for inspiration? Or was it a completely subliminal expression of stories he read about in the news? And does that even matter? As a design professional, you'd better know at least as much as many of your clients will. This article about the newly restored Bauhaus is from a major spread in the New York Times of 2016. Many of your clients would be familiar with this, as well as with at least a superficial history of the Bauhaus, thanks to the major exhibitions that have been devoted to it over the years, which your clients may very well have seen. Some of your clients might also be quite familiar with the terminology commonly used in our field. But for practical purposes, you need to be fluent in the language of design, or you won't be able to communicate with the many other professionals you'll be working with, such as architects, vendors, product designers, and craftsmen. Part of this fluency, of course, is being able to recognize the different styles and know when they first arose. What we see here is a famous American Art Deco installation, Nelson Rockefeller's apartment, done in 1937 by a famous French designer, Jean-Michel Franck. It was featured in a recent issue of the New York Times Style magazine, a publication geared toward the luxury market. In other words, your client. The room is used to showcase the kind of specialty rugs designed by artists since the early 20th century and produced by a renowned 17th century French rug manufacturer still operating today. This is exactly the kind of custom, distinctive merchandise many high-end clients desire, and they expect you to have the knowledge and ability to work with such an artisan to produce it for them. Footnote, your clients are reading these publications, so so should you. 
So knowing what the styles look like and how to use them properly in a traditional manner is one thing. But much more important is being able to use them improperly, if you will, in more creative ways. Anyone can look at design history books and recreate period interiors. Set designers do it all the time. What requires talent, creativity, and knowledge is using them in new, different, unexpected ways. And knowing what the styles mean plays a big role in your ability to do that. What do we see here? The dining room of a couple whose firm is one of the most important in the history of design, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. This may not look like much of anything to you. What kind of talent does it take to make a room like this, you might ask? If you don't know the answer to that or who these people are, wait and see. You will find out. Which brings me to another important reason why you need to study the history of design. You must know and understand the history of your profession. Not only the styles and what they mean, but the great minds who created them. You want to learn from them all you can. Do you know who these people are? If not, you should. You'd better. And you will by the end of this course. Every creative genius in history had innate talent, yes, and other circumstances that contributed to their flowering. But one key thing they all have in common is this. They studied the past masters in their field. They immersed themselves in it. They thoroughly mastered every step along the way. Who is this by? If you said Picasso, you'd be right. And this is Picasso at an early but still groundbreaking step in his evolution. How did he get here? By first being able to draw like this. And through his admiration for and study of this great master, who had been famous a hundred years prior to this time. Nor was the notoriously egotistical Picasso too proud to acknowledge, admire, study, and emulate the work of contemporary masters. Our original image here on the left was just one step along the way in his journey toward the development of the most important phenomenon in painting since the Renaissance, the style that made Picasso famous, analytical cubism. But in addition to this knowledge, Picasso also drew inspiration from many other unexpected, even unorthodox sources, like African art and medieval woodblock prints, as well as newly emerging concepts in physics and philosophy about the very nature of reality. So the more aware you are, the more curious you are about, well, everything, the more powerful your work can be. To use another example, more closely related to our studies, do you know what this is and who designed it? This is the Villa Savoy by one of the founding fathers of modernism, not to mention one of the most creative architects of the 20th century, Le Corbusier. And what inspired him? Well, cubism played a role as well as what might be called the most traditional building in Western architecture, the Parthenon. So if I had to make one final point about all this, I'd say immerse yourself in design history and in life and see where that leads you. Now back to us in the here and now. How are we going to study interior design? First, we need to know what it consists of, and I've spelled that out for you on this page pretty straightforward. But I want to call your attention to the other two points. First, that interior design is a composition of these elements. The word composition itself is key because that's what makes design design. The overall space is composed. And we'll return to this important point again later in the semester. Second, what I call the trickle-in relationship that exists between architecture, interior design, and the decorative arts. Often a style will begin with architecture, then spread to the interior structure, then to the loose objects in the space. And when that doesn't happen, of course it means something. We will study interior design by looking at the origins of these three components, and you now understand why it's important that we do that. 
Here, examples of one of the first kinds of structural supports and early furniture. Noteworthy, they are all organic. Think about what that means. We'll see how they evolved over time and come to understand them by analyzing them from various vantage points. But while there are many points of view in the prism, they all fall under one of two categories, defining characteristics and context. I've provided a handout in the study guides about these two cornerstones of this course, but let's take a brief look at them here. Defining characteristics are what make the object or space look the way it does. They answer the question, what does it look like? And if you don't know where or how to begin identifying them, look to these four areas, form, ornament, material, and production construction techniques. In terms of form, what we see here are two chairs that in many ways are very similar, but you probably also notice a big difference between them. What is causing that? It's the form, the lines, the shape. The one on the left is more curved, while the one on the right is comprised of lines that are mostly straight by comparison, even emphasizing the sharp, crisp right angles of the back. So an important defining characteristic of the chair on the left would be that the form is curved. For the right, we might say that the form is based on straight lines and geometric forms. And why does each have the shape that it does? What caused that shape? What does that shape mean? Well, that has to do with context, and we shall return to that later. In terms of ornament, does the chair on the left have any ornament? If you said no, I'm afraid you'd be wrong. The red color is vibrantly ornamental, as is the elegant sweeping form. The color would be an example of integral ornament, meaning it's integrated into the very fabric of which the chair is comprised. The form would be an example of structural ornament, meaning the structure of the chair itself is ornamental, decorative, if you will. See what I mean? On the right, we see examples of two other categories of ornament. The stunning gilt bronze mount you see there protecting the corner of this desk is an example of applied ornament. That is, an individual piece of ornament made separately, then applied, attached to the object. Behind that, we see two examples of what we call superficial ornament. That is, ornament that sits on the surface of the structure, like wallpaper or paint. Here it is both the red lacquer and the light and airy renderings of oriental scenes painted on the surface in gold. Here some examples of the important role of materials in creating the aesthetic of objects. At left, ebony and ivory, which at the time this chair was made, circa 1300 BC for King Tutankhamun, were very rare and precious materials. On the right, the opposite, a vernacular chair, that is, akin to peasant furniture, a farmhouse chair of a type that's been made since the Middle Ages. The materials, sticks of wood and woven rush, are worth little to nothing and found locally. But though the materials of King Tut's chair were chosen carefully and imported from exotic far-off lands, and those of the vernacular chair were not, the materials of both chairs are loaded with meaning. They are products of a specific context and speak to us about the culture from which they emerged. Finally, production or construction techniques. The chair on the left is not only machine made, it's also intended to express that fact. On the right, our farmhouse chair again, because it's also an iconic example of the meaning of things made by hand, a very important issue in the history of design. The tension between these two techniques looms large in our story, and we'll be talking a lot about what it all meant. These two examples also provide an excellent segue into the question of context, or 
Why does it look like that? Why does it have these defining characteristics? In other words, what does this style, this combination of form, ornament, material, and production mean? Context is related to culture, which is a vast and complex issue. But because it's so important to our study, which is often referred to today as material culture, I thought I'd provide you with a definition of culture that I think is quite thorough. Take a moment to review it before we move on to some of the cultural factors that can shape style. Whether 12,000 years ago or today, these three factors, available materials, available technology, and available skill, play a role in what design can look like. Our ancestors had to have discovered the materials that allowed this imagery to be made, the minerals that produce the color. Someone had to have figured out the technology, the process, the technique of applying color over a hand to create the negative space that produced this pattern. And it had to be perfected. Certain people had to practice how to do it. They had to get good at it so they could transfer the hands of their compatriots and the knowledge, the skills to do this to others. The same with the Pantone chair. Designers had dreamed of creating a floating cantilever chair like this for decades, but it wasn't possible until the materials and technology became available. What happened in the world, in the context, that made this possible about 1970? We'll find out. We will see that ideology and philosophical beliefs are very important in shaping design. On the left, a detail of the Doric order, representing what we know today as classicism. Developed by the ancient Greeks, it was an exacting, concrete expression of their beliefs about who they were and their place in the world. On the right, a set of prefabricated industrial stairs, used in one of the earliest expressions of modernism. Why? What does this mean? What belief made Le Corbusier choose this instead of constructing a stair in the traditional manner? The history of design is chock-a-block with important people from all walks of life who shaped design. Here, two significant historical examples. On the left, Louis XIV of France, who single-handedly created a style that reflected his own personality and values, but which swept the globe and made France the world leader in design, a title they held for centuries. On the right, an example of how the ideas of one person can shape design through the power of printed words and images, which are so easily spread far and wide throughout the world and across time. Palladio's treatise is still consulted today on a daily basis by architects and designers around the world. As the Louis XIV explanation indicates, nations often vied for the position of world leader in design, meaning they created and produced a design that all other nations emulated and, more importantly, imported. One of the greatest of these contests between France and Germany in the years preceding World War I gave rise to two of the most famous styles of the 20th century, Art Deco and Modernism. So we've seen that sometimes nations strive deliberately to become world leaders in design, but other times a confluence of cultural forces can cause this condition to arise organically, that is, to just happen on its own, as in Renaissance Italy and in the United States after World War II. Related to this, of course, is the whole issue of what is commonly referred to as socio-political economic forces, a huge topic exemplified here by the Roman Empire and the Industrial Revolution. But sometimes we see forces that are quite anti-establishment give rise to powerful, influential design movements. Here, an example of two Art Nouveau designs a cornerstone of which was the rejection of all reference to the past, to tradition, even sometimes to the rational. This is also an example of two styles within the same movement expressing similar beliefs but through different characteristics. How can that be? We will see. So this concludes part one of this introductory presentation. 
We'll start part two by looking at what is for us one of the most important cultural influences on design, that of the fine arts. I'll also quickly summarize some other socio-economic political forces that shape design in history. We'll review some of the key vocabulary and concepts used to analyze and describe design and end with a few of what I hope will be fun exercises I devised to illustrate what makes something or a set of things defining characteristics. Mm -hmm.